Well, welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Dynamic Life Baptist Ministries. Thank you so much for you all being here and those who are listening by live stream, those who will tune in later. Uh, we do have people who watch these uh, lessons, these uh, Bible studies, these Q&As, all the things that we've done. And we just appreciate you so much for tuning in. Tonight, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to do a question and answer time uh, because I give out a lot of information to you all. And uh, every once in a while, I need to stop and do a check and see what you're giving and what you're not giving. And what you're doing with, with the information you get. You get. And it's not our, our goal, nor should it be any church's goal, just to fill people's notebooks and fill people's heads with information. You're supposed to be, according to Ephesians chapter 4, equipping the saints to do the work of ministry. And so what are you doing with what you are learning here? And how are you applying what you are learning here? And so... I like to give you opportunities every now and then to ask questions about things that you would like me to expand on or questions about uh, a little more practical application. Even though I try to be very practical in all my sermons and all my lessons and give examples of practical application. You may have been meditating. You may have been going back and reviewing uh, these, these lessons that you've been, because we give you the notes and sometimes you can go back and read them on your own. Uh, I know sometimes you, some of you have questions after the sessions or the next day or Sunday, and you hit me up and said, Pastor, I couldn't think of anything right then, but I got a whole notebook full of questions now. So all the questions that you wrote in your notebook sometimes, because hopefully you are reviewing, hopefully like the Bereans, you are going to examine these things to make sure they are true. I, I appreciate you trusting me you don't trust me so much that you don't check me. I'm not afraid of being checked because I know I've done my homework. But I, I, we are fallible. We, are, we, we have flaws, and even as leaders. Uh, I like what John MacArthur says. He says that uh, he's not above being wrong. He just don't know where he's wrong at. Right. And if you would point it out to him, he would be happy to sit down with you and study through it study from your side and study from his side to make sure that he's on point. And, and every pastor should have that heart and then be willing to sit down and say, this is how I got what I got. How did you get what you got? And let's compare the scriptures with the scriptures to make sure that we're on point. Um, but even as leaders, there are times when we can uh, know we may not be right about something and still refuse to adjust. Uh, MacArthur tells another story that I heard recently about him and R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul has gone to be with the Lord, but John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul were really good friends. And, uh, but they, they differed on infant baptism. So R.C. Sproul asked Dr. MacArthur if he would uh, debate him on infant baptism. And uh, John said, you know we have a different viewpoint on infant baptism. And R.C. says, that's okay. He said, well, I have one condition, John says. He says, I want to go first. Because I'm going to use the Bible, and I don't know what you're going to use. And so I want to go first so I can lay a biblical foundation for why I take the stand I take. And then you can go wherever direction you want to go. And so they had the debate. And when he and John were alone, R.C. Sproul and John were alone later, uh, John MacArthur asked R.C. Sproul, well, who won the debate? And R.C. Sproul says, well, you did. And so John said, well, what are you going to do about infant baptism? He says, we're going to keep baptizing babies. <laughs> Even good men can be stuck with where they are in spite of what the scriptures might say. And so it can happen to all of us. And so we just all need to be careful. So I will... You can ask the question. I will try my best to repeat the question for those who are listening by live stream, and then I will endeavor to answer the question. So who will be the first to go through the sheepfold? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you had talked about last week, um, you had given us in your unity, um, it says the practice of the model. So we are, as believers, we have the same Holy Spirit, um, we have the same scriptures, we have the same Lord. Um, 
when it comes to us helping to foster that unity, is that something that's going to happen more naturally as each one of us is growing? Or is it something also that, or maybe and or both, that we need to help bring about by having more fellowships and different stuff like that? I mean, I know you can have fellowships and everybody not be in unity because they're not being controlled by the Spirit. So is that a one and or both, I guess? So if I can summarize your question, and if I don't say it right, please help me correct it for everybody. You're asking under the third part of our study out of Ephesians chapter 4 on unity, under the practice of unity or practicing the model of unity, uh, the specific point, we listed several aspects based on the word one, one body, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, how does that unity manifest itself? Is that the question you're asking? Uh, first of all, we have to realize that the unity, uh, based on the prayer of John 17, which we looked at at the same time, is something that Jesus prayed for for those who were yet to be born again as a result of the message of the gospel being shared by the apostles. So that would be true for us also. There are people who are yet to be born again by our sharing the same gospel that the apostles would share that led to people being made a part of the body of Christ by the new birth, by the Holy Spirit placing them into the body of Christ, by the Holy Spirit indwelling them, by the Holy Spirit filling them and giving them the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, and that helps to bring about the unity that is built in the DNA. So it's there in your DNA, but like an athlete or someone who has a skill, if you don't exercise and enhance that skill, your having the skill will not manifest itself so that it can be seen and so that it can be practiced. So it's built into the DNA of the gospel, it's built into the DNA of the new birth, it's built into the DNA of the church, but it only manifests itself when we exercise that commonality that we have in Christ, when we exercise those attitudes of lowliness and meekness and long-suffering and loving forbearance. It only manifests itself when we do that. So God has made it possible. He empowers you, but you got to exercise and work it out. And when we don't do that based on the common identity, another message that we did based on Galatians, that common identity where there is neither Jew nor Greek, a free nor slave, barbarian nor Scythian, but we're all one in Christ Jesus, male and female, we're all one in Christ Jesus. When we don't exercise that out, then people don't see the unity that was built in to the new birth for all who are born again. We don't see the unity that the Spirit brings about because the glue stays in the bottle and never gets on the people that need to be glued together. And so we come to church and we're in the bottle, but the glue is not meant to stay in the bottle. And so we need to be low, have lowliness or humility. We need to be meek in various circumstances and situations. We need to be long-suffering when it comes to circumstances and situations, but that loving forbearance has to do more with people. Long-suffering has more to do with circumstances and situations in, in many cases. And sometimes we let circumstances and situations get us so frustrated we have no loving forbearance with people. but you trace it back up the ladder, you don't have any loving forbearance because you are not long-suffering, because you are not meek, and because you are not humble. See, the gospel should make all of us humble. When you understand that you are just as much a sinner as the most wretched sinner you can think of in the eyes of God, nobody has any place for pride. But when you think your stuff don't stink as much as somebody else's stuff don't stink, then we can have different levels of stinking. But if you were, the problem is you're not the ultimate evaluator of what's stinking. God is, and God has no stink. So his standard of stinkiness is totally different than us looking at one another. See, the whole thing is, brothers and sisters, if I must be righteous, 
And the standard of righteousness is God himself. All of us fall short. Amen. But if I make somebody else the standard of righteousness, then I can always look more righteous than somebody else. But when God is the standard, and you see that you fall short of his standard of righteousness, everybody runs to the cross. But when you don't see that you're unrighteous because you're comparing yourself with your own persuasive speech, Good job. your own talk in your head and in your own heart, and not with the word of God, then you will never see yourself for who you really are. That's why we have Romans chapter 3. There are none righteous, no, not one. So if we don't use God's standard and we use some other standard, then we're using vain philosophy and vain philosophy can't save you. Vain philosophy always contradicts the sufficiency of Christ, the deity of Christ, and we'll learn this Sunday, the humanity of Christ. And so now, rather than ending up in the book of Proverbs with wisdom, you end up in a book of Ecclesiastic, frustrated by human wisdom. And everything will be what? Vanity, all is vanity. It's empty. It's empty. And we got a lot of empty vanity and a lot of empty philosophy floating around in our culture. And it has crept its way into the church and into our home and into our schools. Because we, do no, we no longer bring to bear the word of God on these issues. Everybody got their own opinion. Everybody's got their own persuasive speech. Uh, but Paul warns us, Christ warns us, these days are coming and these days are here. Yes. Okay, I have a question from a viewer. Viewer. Uh, Sister Robinson says, what about children who die do they go to heaven? I've heard it is based on the age of accountability. What does scripture say about this topic? How's that in Colossians or anything else I talked to? I'll answer the question. I'll answer the question. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Repeat the question one more time. She says, what about children who die? Do they go to heaven? I've heard it based it is based on the age of accountability. What does scripture say about this topic? Nothing. Nothing. Let me say it one more time. Nothing. You see, the Bible says, well, let me tell you what the Bible says on it. Some the secret things belong to God. Matter of fact, what he says about that, if I can use earthly uh, terminology, it ain't on your business. See, why don't we be more concerned about what God wants us to know but the things that God don't want us to know? The Bible says there are secret things that belong to God, but the revealed things belong to us. So, based on my understanding from studying Scripture, there is nothing in the Scripture that guarantees you what happens to baby when they're dying. The best we can come up with is whose son? Whose son died? Because of sin. Jesus. No, 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 no. Y'all being too Sunday school. Wasn't there a man named David that slept with a woman that wasn't his wife? Did she get pregnant? Yeah. Did the child die? Yeah. And the best we can get is David says he found comfort in the fact I he can't come be with me, but I shall go be with him. That's, that's the only thing you got. And that's not a guarantee. Because that could just be a grieving father hoping for something. Now, theologically speaking, if I put on my theological thinking cap, here's where I come to settle on this issue because we get asked these questions and so there are no new, new questions. They're just questions that are new to you, but I've heard this question before. Whoever and whatever a, the just and righteous God will do. He will do what is righteous and just. Amen. That's my answer to that question. 
My, my answer is, I trust that God will do whatever is righteous and just. And if it is righteous and just for him to save that baby and bring that baby to heaven, then the righteous and God, just God will do that. If he does not decide to do that, he is righteous and just in doing that. This is why some questions can only be answered by the care, knowing the character of God and trusting in that character. Because where the Bible doesn't speak, all you can do is speculate. And speculation is very dangerous. So if God decides that he will usher those children who were aborted or died in childbirth into heaven without them ever hearing about Jesus Christ, He's righteous and just in doing it. If he decides not to do that, he's righteous and just in doing it. That's how I would answer that question. Okay. So isn't that then just showing the importance of what Scripture says about raising your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, and that starts from the day they're born? But see, that's revealed to us. Yep. But we weren't about the secret stuff. And we ain't even doing the real, real stuff. We worried about what God won't do with them babies that have been aborted and died in childbirth, and we didn't even do what he told us to do with the ones that make it through childbirth. Amen. Amen. How about we focus on what he told us to do with the ones who make it through childbirth and let him worry about the ones that don't make it through? But this is what it, this is what it's like to want to know God, things that God says only I should know. If God is righteous and just, whatever he does in that situation will be righteous and just. But I want to hear about it and see whether I agree with how God does things. Or, very humanly speaking, some people just want to try to comfort people with something they don't know whether it's true or not. You want to be able to go tell that mother, it's okay, that child is in heaven with God. And you think you're doing a good thing, but you're telling them something you don't really know. Because the secret things belong to God. The revealed things belong to us. The things we don't see yet belong to faith in what God has said. That's the three ways you deal with those things. The secret things belong to God. That's God's business. The revealed things belong to us. And the other things you have to trust by faith. Does that make sense to everybody? Amen. But you don't have any scripture support for what happens to unborn children or children that are aborted or die in childhood. But you do have a lot of scripture about what to do with the kids that are born. that are in your house, in your community, in your schools. And we don't really care about what God says about that as much as we care about what God doing with the stuff we don't know about. Some have good intention, some just curious, some just ask a question because they want to ask questions. But that's how I would respond to that question. There is no biblical president for telling you what happens in those situations other than the one I quoted about faith. And that may have been just been a grieving father who was just hoping to see his child one day again. And now depending on what you think and what some believe to be the extent of Christ's death on the cross, that's a whole other theological debate and conversation. Uh, did he die for all sinners everywhere? And then it's only applied to those who believe, or did he die for those who believe? That's a whole nother theological debate. Some in our one camp, some are in the other camp that I just mentioned. The atonement is sufficient for everybody, but it's only applied to those who believe. So if the atonement's for everybody, then that's another way they try to cover the unborn child or the aborted child. Good question, though. Thank you, Sister Rice. Yes. 
to build you up, to encourage you, to exhort you, to serve you, to minister to you. Amen. So that Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 16, which follows right after Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 10, can happen. See, Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 10 happens when the church does Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 16. Y'all need to read that? Okay. Let's go there. Because it, 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 it's all connected. See, you guys are asking me how this stuff happened. I'm like, is this the Bible? I won't read verses 1 through 6 because we've already done that. But look at verses 7 through 10 with me. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But he has also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Jesus came from heaven and came to what? Earth. And he went back to what? And when he went back on the day of Pentecost, who came to earth? You, you get the point? See, some people translate this, or they say, well, he went into the bowels of the earth. No, no, no. It's talking about coming from heaven and coming to earth. That's all it's talking about. Jesus was in heaven, incarnated in man. John chapter 1. Pastor John's been teaching you guys in John, right? Amen. Amen. Jesus ascended, chapter 1 of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, something else descended that was just like the one that ascended. And now in tabernacles among God's people, just like Jesus tabernacled among men in John chapter 1. See, that's why Acts is the work of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. The book of Acts is about the Holy Spirit first. Not the apostles first. So we don't understand what the point of the book is. You come out with stuff that the book doesn't intend. The book of Acts is about the work of the Holy Spirit and now empowering the church, which are Jews and Gentiles, who are now saved by faith in Christ, taking the great commission, the gospel, to the then known world. That's what the book of Acts is. The focus of the book of Acts is not the miracles. The focus of the book of Acts is the work of the Holy Spirit through the church. And taking the gospel and empowering them to what? Fulfill the great commission, which if you read Acts chapter 1, Jesus told, don't go do anything I told you to do until you receive what? <coughs> you know what you're supposed to be doing. But here's what else you know happened walking me. You can't do it. But I'm going to send you one who's just like me to help you do it. And when he comes, what do they do? They do it. Now when does that end? When the church is raptured. Since the church hasn't been raptured, what's true there? Because we're still supposed to be fulfilling what? But you don't get the Holy Spirit enabled if you ain't on the Holy Spirit's agenda. And the agenda the Holy Spirit is on is the Great Commission. This is why many of our church are powerless. This is why many of the people in our church are powerless. Because the Holy Spirit is not empowering you for your agenda. He's come to empower you for one agenda and one agenda only. To go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I command you to do. And lo, I will be with you always to the end of the age as you are doing this. And then you jump over to Acts chapter 1, which picks up on the end of Matthew 28. And that's exactly what he tells you. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, Acts 1 8, and you shall be my. Witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and other parts. And the book is broken down what they did in Jerusalem, what they did in Judea, what they did in Samaria, and what they did to the other parts of the world. And that story hasn't ended to the church is left. So your gifts are not for you. 
Your gifts are for the church so that we can fulfill what? The Great Commission. And that's when the Holy Spirit will become active in your life when you're on that agenda. If you're not on that agenda, there's no need for you to have spirit. Mm-mm. So we, we got the spirit making us jump, shout, boogie, flip over pew, do chandeliers, fall off the floor, run through walls, run into walls, everything but the Great Commission. <laughs> so he says he descended in verse 10. He who descended was also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might feel all things. Jesus told them in John 15, 16, I will send you a helper, someone who is just like me. When you read the testimony of Jesus, when you read the baptism of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, the Holy Spirit descends upon him at his baptism. Now here, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Let's do it close. Come close. Jesus did not do what he did because he was God. Because if Jesus did what he did because he's God, we can't do what he did because we're not God. But if Jesus did what he did because the Holy Spirit came upon him, then we can do what he did because the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Hello? So you really have no excuse. I have no excuse for not being able to do what I was born again to do. Because it's not dependent on you is dependent on the one who empowers you, but you can quit and grieve him. Yes, sir. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. You can quit and grieve him so that it doesn't look like you got it. You can reject him. So you don't need pills, you don't need alcohol, you don't need to lay on nobody's couch. You need to be filled. With him. That's what he's saying in Ephesians chapter 5. Don't be drunk with wine, that is dissipation. That's the way it's done. But be what? Feel, be controlled by your force, be led by the Spirit. The problem, brothers and sisters, is we don't stay filled. Listen, listen. We talked about this in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 29. Paul ends Colossians 29 before he goes to the next text. And it's his power that works mightily in me. Paul says, I'm in jail. I've been beaten. I've been rejected. I've been, I've been lied to. I've been lied on. I'm starving to death. I'm in this dark, dank, filled prison. How do I keep it moving? I keep it moving because I ain't keeping it moving. It's his power that works mightily in me that keeps it moving. People worry about me burning out. The only way I can burn out is by what I'm doing is I'm doing it in the flesh. If his power is working mightily than me, and he can't run out of power, I can't burn out. Oh, y'all ain't, ain't with that, y'all ain't with that, y'all ain't with that. Because that removes all y'all excuses for being lazy. It's his power working mightily than me that enables me to go the way I go and do what I do in spite of my situation and circumstances and all the people rejecting me. There are some bathrooms you can walk into. <laughs> oh, you can walk into them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I find an illustration everywhere. <laughs> Y'all be working, I'll be watching, I can think. There are some bathrooms you walk into where you have to flip the light switch to get the power. Now the power is there the whole time. But you have to flip the switch. See, some of y'all flip switching power Christians. But there are bathrooms you can walk into nowadays where if you walk in a room, the light just come off. That's the difference between being filled and you trying to do it yourself. I just came up with that illustration right now. Because <laughs> this power works my way. 
and you keep trying to find the right switch. Now the problem is, if you're not familiar with the room, you don't know where to switch at. You're feeling around the wall, trying to find it. I'm trying to find the right thing to get me going. I'm trying to find the right thing to make me serious. I'm trying to find the right script to help me act right. Find the right. I'm trying. The only problem is you in the dark. But if you walk into a bathroom where you don't have to find the switch, oh y'all ain't praying with me. <laughs> And it's set up so the light just comes on by movement. See, the reason you can't get the light on in your life because you ain't got no motion. God empowers people who are moving, but moving according to the agenda He has set. So if the motion is all is all that needs the motion, and the Holy Spirit is the one to bring unity, why are we trying to get unity when we just endeavor to have the unity we already have? In the bond of peace. See, we ain't got unity because we ain't at peace with one another. The black Christian ain't at peace with the white Christian, the white Christian ain't at peace with the black Christian. All the other people looking at us come out, don't we exist? What about us? Why is it just black and white folk? Males ain't in, ain't, ain't in peace with the females, the females ain't in peace with the males, the males ain't in peace with the males, and the females ain't in peace with the females. So how is there going to be unity in all that mess? Don't you know who you are? And that's why I've spent all this time taking you guys you got to understand your new identity. You have a new identity. That's why the Christian life is Christ in you and you in Christ. Not whether you're Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist. It's Christ in you and you in Christ. That's the unity. We have that in common. That's where we start if we're talking about unity. Not on all these other sidebar issues. So, the next, wait, did that answer the question? No, that was a long answer. You can read the rest of the chapter for yourself. But it's all connected. But it only happens at each joint what? Supplies, he says in the next part of the text. It only happens when you have leaders who are so being empowered by the Spirit, who are equipping the saints to do the work of ministry until we all reach the unity of the faith in Christ Jesus. So that we're no longer tossed to and fro by every wind of You gotta get the false teaching out. You gotta get it out of the church, you gotta get it out of the home, you gotta get it out of your mind, you gotta get it out of the people. Okay. Listen, the church, the Bible, is not like the culture. Thomas Sowell says one of the problems today in our culture is that in the educational system, we used to teach people how to think. Now we want to teach them what to think. Mm -hmm. so true, so true. The Bible does not only want to teach you how to think, the Bible wants to tell you what to think. Yes, okay. Okay. But that's not the way we want to think. How you got the mind of Christ and you don't want to think like Christ? And what the Bible means when it says we have the mind of Christ, we have the mind of Christ revealed right here in the scriptures. But you can bring the scripture to bear on situations that people will spit it out, spit at you, lie on you, leave you, turn from you, and tell you my spirit ain't telling you that. I know something about you. You may not know something about you, but I know something about you. And all of us should know something about somebody who has that kind of mindset and that kind of attitude. But we live in a culture that rejects you saying anything contrary to what people feel and what people think. And people bring that attitude to the household of God. Yes, Sister Brett. So then, you know, based on what you were just saying, talking about 
if we're not using our gifts in the way God designed them to be used, and we're not serving, then we're hindering the unity and the oneness of the body. Is that correct? Well, let's take a little bit deeper. You sin. Just call it what it is. You're sinning. If God has given the gifts and given you the gift for a specific intent in the body with a specific definition of how it's supposed to work and what it's supposed to do and you aren't using it, you ain't having a bad hair day, you sin it. You, you guys know your Old Testament. You've been taught well. You know in the Old Testament that they, they built uh, the tabernacle in the Old Testament. And God gave different gifts to different people, artisans and craftsmen to do different things. What if they had decided they weren't going to do that? God says, I want you to be a craftsman. I want you to work with the gold that's going to go into the tabernacle. And I want you to shape the gold. And, and then, no, nah, I think I'm a potter. I just feel my spirit. I'm a pop. Oh, I want to be the flower man. I want to decorate the temple. I don't want to help build it. I want to decorate it. So when y'all get done, I'll come and decorate it. That's just what I feel like I'm there to do. Well, what, what if they had done that? What's the temple going to look like? Now, the temple was the place that you were building where God's going to do what? He's going to dwell. Where is he dwelling in the New Testament? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says you are the temple of the... Then why y'all... If they wouldn't do it then, why are you doing it now? If you are the place that where God dwells, what you doing to him telling him what you're going to do in the temple in his house? And what you're not going to do? And the sad fact, we do that and there is no conviction and there is no grieving. Somebody got to disconnect. Because there is no way, no how, God is going to let you mess up his program and let you be comfortable doing it. Unless you're not his. Or unless you have grieved your conscience so much it's been seared over and you can't feel it anymore. That's the only way it can happen. Paul says what? <coughs> what is me if I don't what? If I don't do what God called me to do? What? If I don't preach, if I don't go out and plant churches, if I don't go out and share the God, what is me? We don't worry about nothing. We say, I got my grace card. <laughs> grace got me covered. We don't worry about anything. But is it because people don't know their spiritual gifts? <coughs> uh, that's, that's easy to talk. Sis, sis said, she asked a question, is, it, is, is, it, is the, the rationale, right. is the persuasive speech, that people are telling themselves. It's the vain philosophy that people, is that they don't know their gifts. I can fix that for you in two minutes. Come in. We got a chart and Sister Cuts off. We got all these ministry areas. Pick one. And if it don't work, we're going to keep picking one until you find it. But you ain't going to find it sitting there waiting for it. <coughs> I'm just going to wait here and wait for God to rain it down on me and tell me what he wants me to do. Oh, you in the, you in the bathroom looking for the light switch. <laughs> it, that's what you're doing. Hey, sir, get, get involved. And if you don't, if we find out that that's not you, we're gonna we move you over here. If we find out that's not you, we're gonna move you over here. But if you read Ephesians chapter four verse eleven, God gives you gifted men 
who ought to be able to direct you. But we don't want to listen to the gift of it. So brother and sister, I believe this will be a good area for you to serve in. I don't think that fits me. Wait a minute, wait, wait. Have you not read Ephesians chapter 4? He didn't give you that gift. It's the Old Testament illustration again. Who did God give the assignment to to choose the men who would work in a tabernacle where they would work? This is what happened. We don't know our Old Testament. We don't know what it means in the New Testament. The leaders appointed the people based on how God told them to place the people. God told the leaders, break the people down into tens, and break the people down into hundreds, and break the people down into thousands, and break the people down into ten thousand. I don't think I belong in a ten thousand group. I think I belong over here in a ten people group. This is why we're such a mess today in our churches. We don't have godly leadership who lead with courage, not with arrogance, but with courage. Because they are standing confidently on what the book says. It takes courage to be in, in times like this. It takes confidence that you know that God called you to do this. Because all kinds of people are going to tell you, you ain't called. They don't tell you you ain't called, they just don't do what you ask them to do. Because we have taught in America that Christianity is an individualistic thing, not a collective. This is why we keep playing the video, because y'all ain't getting it. Can I tell you a secret? You know how I know you'll be getting it? When you start doing it. Christianity is not an individualistic thing. It's a collective. Is this body part connected to this body part, connected to this body part, connected to this body part? But they have one common goal. The building up and edifying of the body of Christ. How long do we do that? Until. Until we reach maturity in Christ. But you can't have what? Doctrine coming in, contradicting all that. And people just talk to and from. And that's why you got to teach and reteach and teach and reteach and teach and reteach. But you got to be creative to come up with it and put it in a different way so it's something new and they act like they haven't heard it before, but it's the same thing you've been saying all the time. Because the Bible doesn't change. And that's work. That's a gift. That's creativity. But you should have creativity in your ministry here. Listen, if God has gifted you to do it, he's given you everything you need to do it. Everything. But he only empowers motion. So we can solve that, that, that I don't know what my gift is. What's your passion? What's your passion? What is it that you see in life that just frustrates you and you wish you could do something about it? What keeps you awake at night? I mean, I'm really concerned about our kids. I'm really concerned about young boys. Then I got some idea where you might function best. What, what keeps you awake? What disturbs you that disturbs God? Now, you can't know what disturbs God if you ain't in his book. Because God got all kinds of stuff that disturbs him. The problem is his children aren't as disturbed as their daddy is. Or we'd be doing something about this stuff. Because we're the only ones who can. And it starts with you individually. It moves to your home. It moves to your community. It moves to your job. And it moves to your church. We do this thing backwards. We start with the church, try to hit the community, 
talk about our job, then we do the home, and then we do deal with ourselves. You know, that's backwards. This is the equipping station. The mission field is out the door. Listen, what are we doing in our community to reach our community? All kinds of people dying and going to hell around here. We drive in, we drive out. We drive in, we drive out. What are we doing? See, this is what the theology is saying. If God put this church here, and you are a part of the church, then this is your target community. I live in this community. I can tell you all about it. It's got problems. It's got issues. It's got hurting people. It's got lost people. It's got broken people. It's got people that need Jesus. Amen. But let's be honest. For most of us, we only in this community on Sunday. Maybe Wednesday. But right now, we're not impacting the community. The thing we did to impact the community happened at 6.30. And most of y'all weren't here. Prayer meeting. I know that's foreign to you, but prayer meeting. We can impact the community by prayer. We're not impacting the community right now. This is the equipping time. This is the gas station. I'm sticking the guzzle in your tank trying to fill it up. Ain't no work going on for the car sitting at the gas station. The pump is working. I'm the pump right now. I'm working. Y'all the car. And I'm hoping when I fill you up, you'll leave here and use some energy to go down the road and reach some people. Yourself, your home, your community, your job, your church. Community. Did I answer your question? So y'all got everybody here, anybody here not saying? And everybody got to get But y'all in the bathroom looking for the switch. How about some motion? Maybe the light will come on. Maybe the light will come on if you had some motion. Based on God's agenda. Not based on ours. That's what I like about Matthew chapter 6. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And, and this is killing the church. Because it's killing God's people. You know, you know what's killing God's people? Worry. You know what's killing our church? Worry. Because the people are in church. Listen to this. Verse 25 of chapter 6. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. Pastor, pray for me, Pastor. What's wrong, sis? What's wrong, bro? My life. My life. What you doing worried about that? <laughs> and that's exactly what he says. <laughs> Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Now, you got to get this. These are the basic necessities of life. Yes, sir. Come on, Jesus does not understand what we're going through, right? Yes, he does. Jesus says, don't even worry about the basic necessities of life. Now, is that survey the world? Most of y'all ain't worried about the basic necessities of life. You got food, you got clothing, you got shelter. But he's telling people who don't have those things, don't worry about it. Amen. 
See, y'all not in the poor category. Y'all in the wealthy category. Go read these things. Go read the Bible about the wealthy folk, because that's the category most of y'all in the morning. The rich folk that he talks about. That's the category of people in America. Are in. I'm talking about the poorest people in America are in the rich category of the Bible. Is not your life more than food and body more than clothing? Look at the birds. I just like Jesus so simple. Look at the birds. Come on, fellas. Come over here and take a look at the birds. You see them birds? Y'all just see birds. I see illustration. Yes, sir. Look at the birds of the air. Well, they neither sow nor reap. They ain't got no job. They don't get no stimulus check. They ain't on no welfare program. And they don't have no affirmative action. Ain't nobody protesting for them. Ain't nobody rioting for them. Ain't nobody out here feeding them. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. They don't have storage units. They don't have refrigerators. They don't got deep freezers. Y'all got deep freezers, refrigerator freezers, somebody else's freezer. The store got freezers for you. Sam Club that load up the freezers for you. Birds ain't got none of that. Yet. Your heavenly Father feeds them. That's, please, words are so important in the Bible. Nosey doesn't say, their heavenly Father feeds them. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Can you see him looking at the disciples and pointing at them? Your heavenly Father feeds them birds. Now, if he takes care of the birds, and he's calling you to serve him by serving with me, and then when I send you out, what you worried about? Hmm. Are you not more of value than the birds? The answer is yes. yes. Which of you, by, by worrying, can add one cubit to a statue? Worry doesn't help you at all. Matter of fact, worry kills you. It does not help you. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the littleness of the field. Now he goes from the bird and animal kingdom to the plant kingdom. Consider the littleness of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. They ain't got no dressmakers. They ain't no store they can go buy their clothes in. Ain't no Walmart, ain't no Target. Ain't even no rummage sale. You ever see anybody having a run itself on the flowers? So why do you worry about clothing? And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Why? Because Solomon clothed himself, but God clothed the flowers. Your father, your father, your father clothed the flowers. Now, if God, verse 30, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which, to, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, meaning it's what? It's here today, gone tomorrow. It's temporary. Most of us will have a little flower. Will he not much more? See, I, I just like words in the Bible. Not will he take care of you a little bit. Will he not much more? Clothe you, O oh you of little. What's your problem? No. What did you say, problem? No. You didn't say who was in the White House is your problem? No. You didn't say the fact that you didn't have a mom and daddy was your problem? No. You didn't say the fact that you didn't grow up on the best side of town is your problem? No. You didn't say your wife was your problem? Or your husband was your problem. Or in fact, you don't have a wife or a husband is your problem. Your problem is you got little faith. Okay. Now, I like at least he didn't say they have no faith. Amen. You just don't have enough for this to deal with your worry. Worry is a faith killer. Hmm. Faith is a worry killer. Amen. All I got to do is watch it. I can tell what's killing what. 
Therefore, do not worry. Oh, let me read it how y'all normally think. <laughs> Therefore, try not to worry. Yeah. 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 Pastor, come on, come on. I know that I know what the Bible says. <laughs> but will you please come down to the real world? It's only human to worry. Therefore, do not worry. That's a command. It is. a suggestion. Because worry says, I don't trust God. Worry says, I don't believe what God said. Worry says, I don't believe God is able. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles see. Why are you acting and thinking like a Gentile? None say first. They worry because they don't have me as their father. What you doing worry when I'm your father? That's what he's saying. The Gentiles should worry. Because I'm not their father. And their father, if you read John 10.10, 10, comes to rob, kill, and destroy. He ain't really trying to take care of them. Their father is a liar. And the father of lies. He lies to them, but he don't come through. Your father's not like that. Why would you lack faith in your father? For all these things the Gentiles see, for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. He knows you need these things. But listen, why should your father supply these basic needs for you to spend on the agenda of somebody else's stuff. Why should God supply you food, clothing, shelter, drink, so you can go do the devil's agenda? So you can leave him out more? So you can live just to kick him to the curb? And just come back when you need something else. Come on, why, why should he do that? Do you think God would do that? Now, we all experience God's common grace, right? The rain falls on the just and the. The sun shines on the just and the. But when you want the specific stuff that only children should have, That's a different ball game. And God is no fool. And God will not let you use him for long. God is not interested in taking care of you so you can serve another king and another king. But I go to church. I give a tip on Sunday. I sing in the choir. I deacon on the deacon board. I usher in the ushers. I preach in the pulpit. Yeah, and when you leave here, you're going to serve another king. And another king. You came in, served another king and another kingdom. You're going to leave here, serve another king and a king. See, this, this, is, this is why we can't get the unity manifested. This is why lives are not radically changing by the power of God. This is why there's all this divisive in God's house, among God's people. But we're looking to Washington, D.C. for the answer. Mm. Fox News, CNN, ESPN, Fox mm -hmm. Sports One. Days of our lives, young and arrestless, as the world turns and the food burns. <laughs> Entertainment, pleasure, leisure, education. 
and you'll end up just where Solomon is. Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. So we don't have any power to resist sin. We don't have any power to serve God. That's why we got to manufacture worship in the church. Or we got to have music or it ain't worship. He's only worth your worship if the song is worthy to you. Verse 33 is key. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things for everyone who seeks his kingdom first and his righteousness, everything you need will be added unto you and multiply. But you got to seek first. Now last time I studied first, first means Pastor, I would serve, but I got some other, well, he ain't first. Pastor, you know, family, well, if you don't make them first, your family in trouble. And see, there are good things we can make first. And it's always dangerous, Romans chapter 1, to take what God has created and make it first rather than the creator who made it first. And we're all tempted to do that all the time. Especially in America. Because we have so much. We have so much. Our house are cluttered with stuff we don't even need. How many food processors do you need? You ain't got one mouth. How many coffee makers do you need? How many pots and pans do you need? We don't even cook anymore. Well, we got all the pots and pans. Just think about it. Go home and do a survey of your house. Just go home and do a survey of your house. What you need with all them clothes? You ain't got one body. There's only seven days in a week. Why you got all them shoes? You only got two feet. Two feet. 18 pair of shoes. Oh, I gotta have one to match each outfit. And when you get in them outfits, how are you seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? I'm trying to tell you what's wrong with the church in America. Washington ain't the problem. Biden ain't the problem, Trump ain't the problem, George W. Bush ain't the problem, Obama's not the problem. They are a problem, but they are not the problem. I'm going to say it on the mountaintops till I die, the church is the problem. Those who proclaim to be God's people are the problem, because we are not seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. We're distracted by all the things. I remember growing up, man, we, we lived in the hood. We had one car. Now the kids couldn't drive yet, one car. You come by my house, I'm just talking about the clays. I ain't talking about y'all, because I'll be mad when I talk about y'all. Everybody in my house got a car. And we got a truck, don't nobody drive, so not bad. A collector's item. And got a car in the garage that my son owns. That he don't drive. That's one, two, three, four, five cars that sit out the back of my house. And then we got people on TV talking about we deprive. We're discriminated against. We want our fair share. You live in a house with 18 rooms, but ain't but two of them. 
and you deprive. Look He says if you got food, clothing, and shelter, be thankful for these. We got way more of that. We still don't think we have as much as we deserve. I got two pair of dress shoes. That's it. Two. I won't go buy another one until those break down. It is sad when you got to have a room in your house for just your shoes. No, I do Yes. And you would like to think that's just worldly people. No. Nope. <laughs> no. Nope. That's Christian folk. Amen. You gotta have a closet for the closet for your clothes. Oh right, yeah. There we go. Just two closets. Just two. And we're deprived. And God says, when you put on them clothes, how does it seek first the kingdom of God and my righteousness? And why didn't you check with me before you went out and bought all them clothes? I would have told you you didn't really need all that. But we don't check in with him before we buy stuff. Come on, tell, you don't pray before you buy. Amen. God, now I know I got 18 suits at home. I'm going to pray and ask you, should I buy three more? So, God, you know I'm expanding a little bit. How about you push back from the table and you want to buy them suits? <laughs> Listen, we don't have money to get the mission because our mission is ourselves. We don't have, we won't go do mission and we don't have money to get to those who will do the mission because our mission is ourselves. And then we wonder well, how come we don't have unity. Mm -hmm. I said, how are you? How am I gonna create unity and y'all gonna yeah, diss me and diss the kingdom, grieving the Holy Spirit? How, how are you supposed to have unity? Won't you use your spiritual gifts and your talent. Because you've bought into the American mindset that it's about the individual and not about the collective whole. Next question. I think I dealt with that one and the other ones quite a bit. One more question. Yes. Um, can we talk about deity for a minute? Yes, You were talking about um, depending on the deity and sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So when you get to talking about deity, like you're talking about like the fact that he's God or the position, and I know it's not a position, but it's classic. Okay. Um, <coughs> of the position that he plays in the Trinity. Both and. All of it. Okay. All of okay. it. We're talking about deity. He's God. He's co-equal with God. Same thing he said in Colossians chapter 1 and all those verses I gave you Sunday mm -hmm. under the third point. That's mm -hmm. what we're talking about. So so it is both and. It's yep. the fact that he is God. And on top of that, it's also the person and works of Jesus Christ, like what he actually did. So it's all of those things, not just one particular thing you picked out. Correct. I was trying to categorize it. Thank you very much. It, it, he's the fullness of God. We're going to talk about that Sunday. He's the fullness. All that God the Father is, God the Son is. Yeah. So you can't compartmentalize that. Because we're talking about the fullness of God together. in bodily form. Mm -hmm. One. See, he's dealing with heresy that 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 uh, was part of early Gnosticism that said that anything made of flesh was evil. So Christ couldn't be God and be in human form because if he's in human form, then he. So he's dealing with a number of false teachings. We're going to break it down for you over the next 
uh, several sermons that, that it comes together and is this agglomation, syncretism, like that's why I gave you mm -hmm. the definition of syncretism mm -hmm. very early, because that's what's happening. You take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and a little bit of this, and come up with this. But it all is an attack against the deity and the sufficiency and the human, humanity of Christ. And anything that attacks that is heresy. That's why critical race theory is heresy. Because they're saying to certain people, the reconciliation work of Christ is not sufficient for them. But if he's sufficient, how's he not sufficient for them? But see, pastors don't know this stuff. So they can't refute it when it comes down the line. Or they let their earthly agenda override the kingdom agenda. Or they try to mix them together. Yeah. And that's heresy. Okay. It takes some courage. It takes confidence in knowing what the text means and what it doesn't mean to stand against it. Because people who like to go on social media and say stuff. Mm -hmm. Takes courage. You got to know that you know that you know. Mm -hmm. But see, we don't want to be attacked like Paul was attacked. Mm -hmm. We don't want to go to jail. We don't want to have everybody forsake us. And we're just standing there by ourselves. Because everybody has left us because they don't want to be around us because they don't want what we're suffering. Mm -hmm. Paul knew what that was. Jesus knew what that was. Why don't we know what that is? The reason we don't know is because we don't take the stands. We don't take the stands. Well, great questions. A lot of information thrown at you as always, but hopefully that was helpful. But this is my burden. This is my passion. This is this is just what God has given me to, to pound the gavel on and pound the table on. And we as a church got to step up to the plate. And COVID is not an excuse for not doing what God has called us to do. There's something worse than COVID. People dying of COVID going to hell because the people who were scared of COVID Amen. who gonna die and go to hell. Because we all want to go there. We just don't want to go anytime soon and we don't want to die to get there. Jesus wasn't like that. Paul wasn't like that. The early apostles weren't that like that. People down through church history weren't like that. Because the Great Commission partnered with the Holy Spirit to drive this thing. And it's driven into the church and it's driven out of the church. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity and this privilege that it is to share these things with your people. Guide us and lead us. Um, show us ourselves. From the pulpit to the back door, we all have changes and errands we need to make changes in. Because none of us do this perfectly. None of us do it the way we know we should. But thank you for your word and thank you for your leaders that constantly keep it in front of us so that we may stay aware of it. Bless your people. Strengthen them. Help those who want to do right but struggle with them in life. Let us help one another and encourage one another and exhort one another and come alongside one another. Not even for the church's glory here in 1916, but for your glory. So that people will say that God is in this place and that he's running the show because we see him in his people. And we promise to give you all the praise and Jesus' name.